Putin's orders were clear. Capture Bakhmut by the 9th of May. Victory day for the Russians. Today is 8th of May. They have less than 24 hours. So let's see how far the Russians have gotten Bakhmut. How much they have yet to go. You could truly say so close yet so far. Assess control of the terrain in Bakhmut as of May 7, 2023 by the International Study of War. These yellow areas are newly Russian claimed territory over the past week. And we can see they're moving very slowly. They're gaining ground. Even yesterday I got some frontline news that they gained some ground. But they are far, far away from capturing the whole of Bakhmut. Because Ukrainians don't seem to be just pulling out of the entire city. They continue what they have always done. A very effective fighting retreat. Russians and Wagner PMC are incredibly desperate in Bakhmut. Because the political order has come down to take Bakhmut. They have less than 12 hours. Yesterday evening we saw incendiary munitions used over Bakhmut. Over a huge urbanized area. You have seen them. Fiery rain coming down. Igniting everything that is in its path. You cannot put these fires out you have to wait until they burn out. Russians have this pattern before nightfall they start bombarding with artillery then they send in their infantry wave after wave they fail then they use the incendiary munitions to just burn everything to the ground. They use incendiary if their attacks have failed many days in a row and now of course they have left in 12 hours they will use incendiary trying to just burn the Ukrainians out but this causes a lot of casualties to the civilians unfortunately. But yes we can see the desperation in their actions. What Ukrainians have started to do in Bahamut for the last month is they know they're slowly retreating so they pull out of a, an apartment building right a banelka five-story banelka they mine the whole building not just rooms but the foundations of the building we have seen videos of it then russians occupy that building because in bahmut fighting is not happening for big areas but building by building so if you get a new building you put a lot of forces into it to hold it so Russians bring about 100 new troops into the building to fortify and keep it and boom Ukrainians blow the foundation up the whole Panelka comes down. I've seen it on videos. This makes the casualty rate incredibly high on the Russian side and makes them paranoid and jumpy. They don't trust anything. That makes movement incredibly painfully slow and casualty heavy. It starts to seem to me that they won't be able to capture the whole of Bahamut before the counteroffensive begins, looking at the tempo. When I was a kid, I loved eating cereal. But now that I'm older, I try to keep an eye on my calorie and protein intake. This rules out most of the cereal for me, but not Magic Spoon. I work out every day, so I need my protein, and Magic Spoon is here to deliver. Magic Spoon is also great for low-carb lifestyle, or for diet, or for those who are carb conscious. Magic Spoon cereal have 0 grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein and 4 to 5 net grams of carbs in each serving. Magic Spoon cereal bars have 1 gram of sugar, 10 grams of protein and 4 net grams of carbs and only 130 calories per bar. They're also keto friendly, gluten free, grain free and soy free. I wish they were free. Click the link below to get some Magic Spoon cereal today. You can build your very own variety box and use my code ESTONIAN69 for $5 off. You can choose from the best selling cocoa, fruity, frosted, peanut butter, cookies and cream and maple waffle flavors. Plus other awesome flavors like honey nut, blueberry muffin, birthday cake and cinnamon roll. You can also add the cookies and cream and cocoa peanut butter flavored cereal bars to your variety box. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link below or scan the QR code on the screen and use the code ESTONIAN69 for $5 off. Or go to magicspoon.com slash estonian69 to save $5 off your order today. Also, for my Canadian and British fans, Magic Spoon now ships to Canada and the UK. Ukrainians have started to bombard Russian rear areas very heavily. Two days ago at night, this was the schedule of the bombardments. I mean, of course, we have this information after it all happened. 4.15 a.m., three Saki airbase explosions in Crimea. Saki is a military airfield in Crimea. Four minutes later, Yevbatoria, nine explosions. Three minutes later, Sevastopol air defense is active suddenly. Then, seven minutes after that, we have Nova Fedorivka in Crimea, explosions happening. Then, six minutes after that, we have Kozachka Bay, boom, boom, boom. Four minutes later, another Sevastopol air defense was active. 
Some 20 minutes later, Krasna Perakovsk explosions. Over the course of an hour, Ukraine attacked a wide area with drones, air defense active in several places. Ukrainians have shown their capability to attack several places at once, which is a difficult thing to do in war. Might seem easy, but that's that's where countries actually have issues with. Ukraine is able to do it. It is very similar to what happened before the Izium offensive and before the Kherson offensive. For example, bombarding the Russian logistics. Attacking the fuel silos. There is no point in attacking a fuel silo if the counteroffensive starts in three months because in one to two months Russians will have fixed that field silo. If you bombard it you have pretty much a 30-day window when they are lacking fuel and they haven't fixed it. That means if they're attacking fuel silos now because they haven't done it for the past six months they're doing it now. In the span of one month I would think the counteroffensive would start looking at the patterns of what and how the Ukrainians bombard. Dmitry Peskov the spokesperson for Kremlin has said that due to the busy schedule of Putin on May the 9th the most important day of the year for Russia and Russians, Vladimir Putin will host the parade via a video link. He will not be present. The equipment for that is already being installed on the square. The image will be broadcast on several large screens. It is the very first time I know that Putin will not be present on the parade. It is his day. He has made this day bigger than it was before him. It is his doing and he is afraid to come out on a busy schedule. I think he's afraid. He's afraid of the Ukrainian attacks and the assassination attempts. Ukrainians have demonstrated their ability to send drones to Moscow Oblast. At least the ones we have confirmed are Ukrainians. Putin knows this. He's afraid. He doesn't want to come out in his own capital. Truly reminds me of 1984 where the big brother is always watching. There's a huge parade and there's a screen where the big brother holds a speech. What message does this send to the people of the parade, the Russian people who are waiting to see their president showing that he's not afraid and he's hiding away behind the screen? I mean, the Russians must see he's afraid. This is a rare look at the United States supplied Advanced Precision Kill Weapon System, APKWS. These are laser guided rockets. APKWS actually is not a new weapon system, it is a kit to modify old rockets, dumb rockets, Hydra 70 rockets actually. It is a kit that modifies these Hydra 70 rockets, which US has tons and tons in the warehouses. It modifies them to be extremely precise. Laser guided, of course, that says it, but it doesn't say how precise. To a 5 kilometer, we're talking about 10 to 20 centimeters it can hit. That is the most precise explosive weapon I've heard about in my life. We have one footage of Ukrainian arm army using it, and it was incredibly accurate, and these photos are also proof of that. United States only supplied a several of, the of these systems into Ukraine, but being so accurate and US having so much of that ammunition, I think these few systems can do a lot. Talking about new weapon systems or videos of weapons we haven't seen yet, this is a video of Ukrainian troops training with the new Polish armor personnel carrier Rosomak. Poland has about 903 of these vehicles in different variants. Newest of the new, I think this vehicle was commenced in 2002. Correct me if I'm wrong here, it already served in Iraq and they shared the platform with the Finns. It's a new, modernized, very capable vehicle and Ukraine has them. This is a Ukrainian prototype combat drone. This again shows us the ingenuity of the Ukrainian people. Of course, I would switch the wheels for tracks and I would add an anti-armor capability, maybe a laser guided weapon on top of that. Right now, there's nothing this vehicle can do that the Ukrainian modern BTR-4 couldn't do. BTR-4 can carry an entire squad into the battle under fire in, and it has a remote controlled 30 millimeter on top of it. Or was it 20 millimeter? But I can see uses for this as a decoy. Shooting in some area, Russians will bombard it, shoot at it, and Ukrainians open up another angle on the battlefield. But this is just a prototype. I'm sure the final version would have more defenses and more weaponry on it. Very cool to see such things. This is an animal feeder in Kherson. I've never talked about cats and dogs in this war. Owners might die, owners might get injured or just leave their homes because of war and these cats and dogs are left in the cities. This feeder is volunteer made in Kherson. I just finished a podcast with Brandon Mitchell and he talked among other things about the dog situation on the front lines and cats of course also. Dogs have 
adapted to this war. Their owners are dead or gone and they're alone and bombs are falling. So they are they have formed these packs. It's a strong hierarchy in each pack. The rules are set and some of the packs or some of the dogs or cats, they follow some units. They get attached to some units and the units feed them, give them warm places to sleep. And if the unit moves, they sometimes take the dogs and cats with them. Brandon told me that they don't name the dogs or cats because they get killed with their bombardment or they get lost or they panic if there's bombardment and you will lose them and it's harder for the troops if if it's if they're named but every unit on the front line knows animals around that area because they come back all the time for food or for comfort they need it so stay tuned for the podcast it will be uploaded on Artur Ray podcast youtube channel very soon this looks like russians dancing and celebrating something in russia right no this is not russia this is germany Frankfurt, 7th of May. At the same time, Ukrainian civilians are dying on the front lines because of Russian bombardment and these Russians in Frankfurt are waving Soviet flags and Russian flags, praising the regime that is committing war war crimes right now. Putin has banned the marches of the Immortal Regiment. Immortal Regiment is a movement, people's movement, Russians' movement, to remember the Soviet fallen of the Second World War, right? It's supposed to have nothing to do with modern conflicts or politics but during the past 20 years i think under putin's time immortal regiment marches have turned into praising the putin's regime and being anti-west putin has banned those in russia not because he's against them he supports them but because of the heightened ukrainian attack possibility He's afraid of the Ukrainian attack, so he has banned them. Though the Russians do it in Europe. Estonia has banned them, I'm pretty sure Latvia, Lithuania also, but I do hope Germany has the balls to stop this nonsense. This doesn't fly, Germany. It's not okay. In my eyes, the Soviet flag is next to the swastika. It is no different. I know in Western Europe people see it differently. They see it as the swastika, as the bad and ugly. And in, for Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, Polish and the Finnish, there's no difference. They're the same thing, same violence, same war crimes. So if they're free to wave Soviet flags in Germany, that tells me the German government needs to get some more balls to deal with this situation. On this video, you can see how early it starts in Russia. People in Western Europe have moved on from dictatorships, from, from World War II. We've gotten so used to our liberties and rights we don't propagandize our children. But nothing much has changed in Russia. Immediately, if they start to speak, they start to see these propaganda symbols. They start to wave the Soviet flag because their kindergarten teachers put this in their hands. They're being prepared for a battle that comes in 20 years and they will be used like zombies like we see right now in Bahmut. These troops who are 20, 25 years old on the Russian regime in Bahmut, they were once three years old waving this Soviet flag. In 20 years, these children will die for another Russian dictator. It starts at a very early age. The zombifying propaganda works slowly, but it works, unfortunately, very effectively on the Russian population. The Kiev mayor Klitschko said that yesterday was the biggest drone attack on Kiev in the entire war. 35 drones were launched against Kiev. According to different sources, most of the drones were shot down but there were a lot of fires due to the falling of debris. And this is one of the apartment buildings that was set on fire. I'm not sure if a drone hit the apartment building or if it exploded near it and the debris hit it, but the apartment building was destroyed. Fortunately, the residents were not harmed. Let's see what has happened with the Brigozhin drama. In the last video, I stated that he threatened to pull out a bomb for the 10th of May if they don't get more ammunition from the Minister of Defense. At the meantime, he has also gotten Kadurov on his side. Kadurov stating that, yes, his Ahmad One forces or Kadurovites might take over Brigozhin's positions in Bahmut so Prigozhin can pull out. We're gonna watch a video from Kadyrov now answering to Prigozhin's video of him stating that he wants to pull his forces out of Bahmut. Video is translated by Dimitri, aka War Translated, link in the description below. Okay, he, he look, look at his face, it's all swollen, he's breathing very heavily, he does not look healthy at all. He doesn't appear on camera much anymore and his energy is extremely low. He talks slow and there's rumors, people close to him has, have rumored that he has a, a very acute drug problem. He's taken a lot of drugs. И многие, которые ситуации не понимающие, да, 
начали беспокоиться, беспокоиться за ситуацию, но я официально заявляю, ничего не меняется, но он... специальная военная операция продолжается и будет продолжаться до победного конца. Но... То, что Евгений Дон Пригожин хочет оставить Дон Бахмут, но он, то это его дело, потому что, по его словам, если послушать его, к этому принудили и заставили. Но, ну, это бывает на войне, но он, когда мы брали Дон Мариуполь, но он, мы просили пять танков, но он, а получили один. И то, Экипаж, но он, это, этой техники сбежали. Мы вынуждены были да, поймать, привести обратно и посадить дальше, чтобы он стрелял по тем объектам, там, которые нужны. So for Gadyrov, obviously, this is normalized. He is normalizing the fact that they are not getting ammunition. Wagner, I mean. That, oh, we also got only one tank when we asked for five. This is not normal. This is, in, this is normal in Russian way of fighting or waging war, and it's really bad logistics. And for him, one of the leaders of the Russian war machine, it's normal. You can see how the fish rots from the head if he thinks it's normal. He should think it is not okay. The situation should be fixed. But he's like, ah, happens all the time. Also, I can't. The way he speaks, the way he looks, very unhealthy guy right here. I don't know what's wrong with him, but he doesn't look like he has much fighting left in him. где ты да, проводишь специальную военную операцию, да, где ты ответственный. Да, поэтому и не хватало да, снарядов, не хватало патронов, не хватали. Да, когда мы брали варю, когда мы бок о бок да, с человека Вагнер, да, брали да, попасную, да, когда мы очищали Луганскую республику народную, да, Honestly, I feel like he's high right now or something. There are rumors that he has taken, he has done heroin or something with the equivalent strength of a drug, a very strong one. He, lo he doesn't look sober to me. Look what's on his finger right now. What is that? If you know what is it, put it in the comments. I have no idea, but this is attached to his finger. Something's up here. Я сейчас не помню, но я хочу одно сказать, он, если Пригожин уйдет со своим отрядом, придет Кадыров со своим отрядом, ничего не будет меняться, но он, мы должны но он, победить, а победа, это, победа но он, зависит от нас, от народа, от народа российского. Но он, Российский народ многонациональный, многоконфессиональный, да, он, и некоторые называют русский, 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 да, он, да это главный, да, он, нации, да, он, государство. What the hell is he talking about? He's super drugged, swimming around with his talk, not being focused at all. I think he needs a rehab. I mean, this is a leader of the Chechen Republic of Russia. One of the most feared fighters under him and he's a drug addict like this. His public image is this, a drug addict in my eyes. I don't see strength in this man. I don't see decisiveness, motivation. Russia is really lacking good leaders. And after this video, after the precaution has supposedly had, had this verbal fight with the Ministry of Defense, Prigozhin now has claimed that they got a response from the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Defense promised to give them all the ammunition they need and stated that they can do what they want in the Bahmut area and even assigned a contact person who is, brr, drum roll, Surovikin. Remember him, the potato head who was once during the Kherson offensive of the Ukrainian side, you know, during the pulling out the, of the Russian troops, he was the leader of the entire Russian military operation in Ukraine. <clears throat> the butcher of Syria is he called. And he is the contact person for Prigozhin. And they look very similar, both bald and old and looking like potatoes. Two clowns together, they're a perfect match. All of this Prigozhin against the Ministry of Defense, which is now settled, I think, 
it truly feels fabricated. Nothing really happened. And Prigozhin claims it's now settled there. there. I think Prigozhin got a very strong wake-up call somehow. He, un- he went for the last year, he started to verbalize his discontent with the Minister of Defense and now very vocally accusing Karasimov and Shoigu in the video next to corpses. And now suddenly everything is fine. We're going to remain in Bahmut. Don't worry about it. We're getting the ammunition. I think he got a shakedown. A shook, how do you call it? Shakedown. I think somebody talked to him. If you want to fly out of the window, carry on. If you don't want to fly out of the window, you will remain in Pahmut and state that everything is fine. It really smells like it. On May 7th, year 2000, Putin was inaugurated. It has been 23 years of Putin's regime, an entire generation, 23-year-old men are sent to Ukraine. They have been children, teenagers and adult men under Putin's regime. As we saw with the children with the flags before, they have been those children and now they're zombified in that war. So Putin has raised an entire generation of Russian zombies. What are the main features of the Putin's regime? Populism, corruption, the idea of the Russian world as better than any other world as the Western world, the idea of the Russians being over other countries and nationalities. Sound familiar? goes straight back to Germany in 1939. Militarism, total propaganda, lawlessness and mass violence, alcoholism and expansionism. I have a feeling that Putin's regime is at its end. Very soon we will see the collapse of that regime. What will come out of it? A new Russian leader or Russia split into smaller countries? I don't know, but Putin's regime will end. Maybe somebody else will fill his shoes Somebody worse, somebody better. Time will tell. My friends, I recently made a Twitter account where you can get the most important news about this war against Ukraine three times a day. So if you're a Twitter person, my Twitter account is in the description below. It's my name, Artur Rey. I also have an Instagram account where I post videos, photos of me practicing my shooting or doing some barbecue with my friends. So if you're interested in that, also link in the description below. And now I will name you five new patrons who have supported this channel. A reminder, if you're a patron tier, 10 and above, I will butcher your name with my Estonian pronunciation. Get ready to hear your name in a way you've never heard it before. Robert Jakobsen. Well, that was easy. David Tova. (laughs) Stefan R. Ed Steinman. Easy names today. Come on. Hit me with something. Disco D. Come on. These were easy. Next time I want some crazy, crazy screwed up names. Challenge me. Patreon link in the description below. Until my next video, my friends. Slava Ukraini.